pray so well in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, we will jump in, uh, and if you have other requests, we can take them afterward. We we'd certainly want to keep praying and, and uh, be in a spirit of prayer. Today we're looking in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And we're looking at this topic of temptation and the fall of the human race. Temptation and the fall of the human race. Uh, I'm going to open with kind of a silly illustration. It's rather long, but sort of interesting. I got a laugh out of it. But uh, Toad baked some cookies, okay? So picture this Toad baking cookies. And these cookies smell very good, said Toad. He ate one, and they taste even better, he said. So Toad ran to Frog's house because he couldn't withhold a good thing from his friend. He said, Frog, Frog, cried Toad, taste these cookies that I have made. Frog ate one of the cookies. These are the best cookies I have ever eaten, said the frog. Now, what's the best cookie you've ever eaten? Grandmother's? Okay. Okay, we talk, we'll swap cookies afterward. <laughs> so frog, frog and Toad ate many cookies, one after another. And those of you who do this, you know who you are. Right? You can't give you a box of cookies because you're just keep eating them all. I just don't. I won't do that. I just don't. I'm not a sweet lover. Now you give me a pizza and I'll eat one piece after another. So he said, you know, Toad, said Frog, with his mouth full, I think we should stop eating. We will soon be sick. You're right, said Toad. Let us eat one last cookie and then we will stop. Frog and Toad ate one last cookie. There were many cookies left in the bowl. Frog said to Toad, let us eat one very last cookie, and then we will stop. Frog and Toad ate one very last cookie. We must stop eating, cried Toad, as he ate another. Yes, said Frog, reaching for a cookie. We need willpower. <laughs> what is willpower, said Toad? Willpower is trying hard not to do something that you really want to do, said Frog. You mean like trying hard not to eat all these cookies, asked Toad? Right, said Frog. Frog put the cookies in a box. There, he said, now we will not eat any more cookies. But we can open the box, said Toad. <laughs> that is true, said Frog. Frog tied some string around the box. There, he said, now we will not eat any more cookies. But we can cut the string and open the box, said Toad. <laughs> that is true, said Frog. Frog got a ladder. He put the box up on a high shelf. There, said Frog, now we will not eat any more cookies. But we can climb the ladder and take the box down from the shelf and cut the string and open the box, said Toad. That is true, said Frog. Frog climbed the ladder, took the box down from the shelf. He cut the string. He opened the box. Frog took the box outside. He shouted in a loud voice, hey, birds, here's some cookies. <laughs> Birds came from everywhere. They picked up all the cookies in their beaks, and they flew away. Now, we have no more cookies to eat, said Toad sadly. Not even one. Yes, said Frog, but we have lots and lots of willpower. <laughs> you may keep it all, Frog said to Toad. I am going home now to bake a cake. <laughs> anyway, I read that. Okay, so think about that. Does that define some moments in your life? I can just see you now with the ice cream or the cookies or whatever else it is. So if you have blood running through your veins, you know what it means to be tempted. So this morning we're going to look at the first temptation to sin. Think about it, This is the first ever that we're told about temptation to sin, to willfully go against what God established and the results for the human race in general. So notice in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. So it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, 
which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and it is a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the book of Genesis. Lord, what an amazing book where it all began and where it is all going. And so, Father, we pray your blessing upon the reading and hearing of your word and the applying of it. And, Lord, bless each one. And, Lord, apply it differently in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Historian Shelby Foote tells of a soldier who was wounded at the Battle of Shallow during the American Civil War, and he was ordered to go to the rear to find some kind of protection there. But the fight was so fierce, within minutes, he returned to his commanding officer. He said, Captain, give me a gun, he shouted. This fight ain't got no rear. You ever been in a fight that ain't got no rear? Right? You just think you can go to the back of the line and be peaceful there? Right? The, the whole thing was like a a war, and you think about that, that is our experience in this world, isn't it? This fight ain't got no rear, right? But no matter where you go, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a battle. This week I was able to, was blessed to go over to the Capitol building with Carol Conley. Uh, it was an African couple who pastored in South Portland and uh, pastored at the Evangelical Free Church in Waterville. Great guy, great church. And uh, we met up at the Capitol building, and we were just there to pray for the representatives and the senators. And uh, you know, all the lobbyists were there and there were people there with their political agenda and their signs trying to get bills passed. And uh, it was interesting, we met with uh, one particular politician and, and Carol introduced me and he said, he said, well, I'll tell you right up front, he said, I'm unredeemable. And said, I'm unredeemable. I didn't get to talk to him anymore, I have to, to meet him again. But that really struck me. This man, you know, pro-choice, pro-everything that we're against. But one thing that struck me, he said, you know what I appreciate about, he pointed to Carol, about Carol and about Mike. He was talking about Mike Heath, who was there before Carol. He said, you all have always been friendly to me, even though I'm pro-choice. Isn't that interesting? He appreciated the fact that they were friendly to him, they treated him with respect, even though they disagreed with him politically. So I'm really hoping that this is gonna develop into something. Um, Carol asked me to be on his show sometime and talk about my experience going over there, you just go on 105.9 or whatever, but I just appreciated being asked to go over and to pray. Uh, so be praying for the politicians. Uh, there was a group, we just met them in the hall, about seven or eight of them right there, and I prayed over them, and after I prayed, the other gentleman, one of the gentlemen said, he's in the House of Representatives, he said, please tell your people to pray for us. He said, it is so evil here. He said, sometimes when I, we're in session and we're debating things, he said, I can feel the evil on my neck. And he said, please, he said, please tell your people, the churches, to pray for us. Because it's not that there aren't Christians over there. There are a handful of Christians there, but they're just outnumbered. There's so much darkness and wickedness in that place. And I'll tell you right now, if the Christians would, anyone can go in there. You can, you can go, all you have to do is just go through the metal detector. You know, I had to go through twice because I did it wrong. I kept something in my pocket by accident. <laughs> my, phone, my phone or something was beeping. And anyway, so I probably got radiated about I went through there like several times. Probably brain dead now. But anyway, so anybody can go in there. And I thought, you know what? We could just go, just go and Christians could just show up in there and just camp out. And just, you could stand in, in a line with your hands up praying. And, uh, you know, 
the, the power of prayer, but I just realized I was walking through when I was leaving, and Carol and I went and had lunch, but when I left the building, I thought to myself, think about where Satan wants to attack. The capital, where all these decisions are made. Don't you think he wants to show up there? That's why he takes the seats of power, because he wants to ruin people's lives, amen? That's what he wants to do. But we're not gonna let him do that. We can go in there through the power of prayer and have a presence and have an influence on those people. And I thought it was a great idea that Carol had to, to do friendship evangelism, to get to know the senators, to get to know the representatives. I got to meet the senator from the Nobleboro area, uh, Chloe. She, uh, she was there, she was real sweet. She, she actually, she was in session. The way they do it is they send them a note. They send in a note to them. It's like getting out of school. So they probably like, you remember when your mom would send the note and you get out of class? You probably want to get out of those sessions, right? So he sends a note in and I'm waiting down there for her to come out. She comes out and I met her. And she, she knew me, and she, I was like, well, how do you know me? And she said, I was, at, I was at Andy's funeral. She was at Andy's funeral recently. The fireman here in our church went to be with the Lord. And I was like, oh boy, she's probably not gonna listen to me. I really gave the gospel a presentation. <laughs> but my point is, you know, we need to have hope that God can work in the lives of people, right? And, and change hearts, even liberal Democrats, even liberal Republicans, right? The Lord can change their hearts. So that was very refreshing. But getting back to temptation, right? We certainly live in a world, right, that is where we, we experience temptation constantly. The tempter and the temptations are always lurking just around the corner, and the fight does not really have a safety zone, except this. When Jesus Christ is with you, right? When you're walking in the power of the Spirit, and when you're armed with the word of God in prayer, you're in the safety zone, right? You're in the battle. You're, you're engaged. You're right in the battle. He does not pull you out of the battle. But you are equipped in the battle. Amen? You're like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? You, I mean, you get all kinds of ammo. I mean, you're like guns are flying, bullets are flying. They don't touch you. You got body armor on, right? That's how you are in the battle, in the spirit. So notice the tempter. The Bible describes the, the serpent here as cunning as crafty. That means he was attractive, he was quaint, he was skillfully achieving his purposes using deception, okay? That's what he was using, he was using honey. He didn't take the frontal approach, he, he wasn't, he, he was very, very clever, cunning and crafty, he was attractive, quaint, skillfully achieving his purpose, but he was using deception. Have you, ever, didn't you, have you ever experienced that? Someone who's really sweet and kind and buttered you up, and then they work the deception on you. Ever had that happen? A friend of ours in our church in Germany, he was traveling in Italy, he was in the military, and he said, yeah, I was on the, the side of the road, and this guy was so nice and friendly, and he, he had this, this stereo, and he was selling them really cheap, and so you know, I bought one, and I got it home, and I opened it up, and it was a bag of sand. <laughs> right, so just because someone's nice doesn't, I would have probably fallen for that. You know, open that bad boy up and make sure that stereo is inside the box, not a back box of sand. So the deceptor here is, he's skillful at using deception. Now, I don't know um, about talking animals. Today, you know, a parrot can talk, uh, animals talk in movies, but the verdict is out on whether or not animals could talk before the fall. Because the serpent is an animal. And he's engaging Eve in a very intelligent conversation, right? So it just raised some interesting questions. I don't know. I mean, sometimes our cat look like they want to talk, right? <laughs> but it's very possible that they could talk before the fall. I don't know. But I know that this serpent, which is an animal, is talking with Eve. Here in Genesis, a serpent, a snake, is the one doing the tempting. And we are not told here uh, in this passage that it is Satan, but we are told in other passages of the Bible that this is indeed Satan. Notice in Ezekiel 28, verses 13 through 19, we see a parallel in Ezekiel about an evil earthly king to the true embodiment of all evil, Satan himself, the devil, okay? So he's using an earthly king to point to Lucifer, who is the most evil. Okay, so 
Ezekiel 28, 13 says, you were in Eden. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. See how he's beautiful? The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the pearl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So we just, we're just going to pause briefly here. Lucifer was not only extremely beautiful and attractive, but he also was like a grand pipe organ. A grand pipe organ. He had the gift of music. You ever heard the song, Why Does the Devil Have All the Good Music? Right? This is partly why. You were the anointed cherub who covers. And notice this. What do you have that you did not receive? God says, I established you. Think about that. God said this about Lucifer. I established you. See, what Lucifer would grow to believe, because he was so beautiful and because he was so gifted, he would grow to believe that he established himself. And that was his downfall. He forgot that he was not established by himself. He was established by God. He said, I established you, God said. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Those are angels. You were perfect in your ways from the days, notice this, that you were created. See, Lucifer was created. He did not make himself. And notice what happened. Till iniquity was found in you. Iniquity was found in you. So what was the iniquity of Lucifer? We'll find that in a moment. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. Now, let's pause there briefly. Could it be that in heaven, among the angels, that Lucifer ran like an empire, right? Because we are going to be doing work in heaven. It'll be good work. It'll be, it'll be a lot easier than it is now. But think about it. If you go all the time and you don't do any work, you just feel unfulfilled. We'll be doing good work. We'll also have lots of breaks and all that. But could it be that the, the Lord allowed Lucifer to run this empire within the kingdom of God prior to the fall. And Lucifer grew so uh, enamored with his own abilities that he wanted to be God. He wanted God's place. You became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Your corruption, your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they may gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. And what a picture. Talk about hero to zero. Can you imagine that? I mean, I don't know about you, but if I were Lucifer, like, Five minutes after I did that, I've been, I've, I would be thinking, what did I just do? Right? Just got kicked out of the top seat, essentially, in heaven. I mean, under the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there really wasn't anyone else much more powerful than Lucifer or much more gifted. Yet, there's, a, there's an eternity that separates the two. Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all co-equal and co-eternal. Lucifer was a created being. Does that make sense? He was a created being. Unlike the Manichaeans who believe that, that there's a good power and an evil power dueling it out to see who wins. This is not Manichaeanism. Lucifer was a created being. And that's how God cast him down to the earth. Notice 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. Paul says, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his 
craftiness. So your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. So think about that. The devil deceived Eve through his craftiness, and his fear is that Christians would be also deceived. To say, oh yeah, I know you've accepted Jesus, but look, there's this other stuff you need to do too. Jesus plus, right? Or Jesus minus. It's not Jesus plus or minus anything. And so Paul feared that through the simplicity that is in Christ, many would be led astray. Notice John 8, 44 in Revelation 12, 9. It speaks about the, the enemy of God, Lucifer. You were of your father, the devil. Jesus was speaking of the Pharisees. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. It's Lucifer. And has nothing to do with the truth. He was a murderer from the beginning. And has nothing to do with the truth. Because notice this. There is no truth in him. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So is it any wonder that we're seeing, right, in our world, all kinds of lies and deception, right? That's the work of Lucifer. He hates the truth, and he loves to lie, and he loves to deceive, and he loves not just to kill, he loves to murder people. That's why abortion is legal. So all the work of the devil. It's all the work of the enemy of God. And remember, he's crafty. He comes, there's a, a book I read a long time ago called The Beautiful Side of Evil. And it talked about the cults. It talked about how they're presented as loving and so nice and so, so good and so appealing. And then you open the door and look inside and it's a cave of dead men's bones, right? The devil masquerades as an angel of light, Paul says. And his ministers masquerade as angels of light, when in fact they're ferocious wolves. Amen? So don't take my word for it. I just got the blessing of being able to, being able to preach, as long as you can withstand it. But if I say something contrary to the word of God, kick my sir right out the door. I'm just saying it's not my story. I just want to be faithful to the message and to God, right? But, but this is his word. But the devil is a murderer from the beginning. He hates the truth. I watched a, an interview, uh, Richard Dawkins, who is an evangelist for atheism. You know who Richard Dawkins is? You can find this video on YouTube. It's really, it's really interesting. He goes to this rabbi's house in London, and he, he's... Co conversing with him and, you know, trying to find some common ground, you can tell. And I can just tell Dawkins is like, he's salivating at the mouth, looking for the opportunity to do his atheistic evangelism, that's what I'll call it. And so he, he turns to the man and says, so what do you all teach uh, your communities about science? What do you teach your children about science? He said, you should be teaching them evolution. He said, because evolution is accepted science. I love it. This rabbi, it's from another country, and you'd have to kind of follow to, to get his English. But he said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we, we, we teach the kids about evolution. But we believe God created the universe in six days. He said it twice. He's like, yes, Dawkins' atheistic evangelism has failed, right? But he is an advocate. He, he is a, he's a promoter, right? Of lies. Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The God Delusion. It's this thing. He is a well-known atheist, but he is spreading lies. Pray for Richard Dawkins to become a Christian. But he is doing his father's work. He's doing his father's work, the devil, who is a liar and a deceiver. And there would go all of us, right, apart from Christ. Revelation 12, 9 says this about Lucifer. Of the devil, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. Notice this the deceiver of the whole world. The deceiver of the whole world. He is thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. 
So that's just a little about the tempter. Notice the tempter's message. Notice the tempter's message. The serpent, the tempter, misquotes God here. Notice what he said. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now hang on that. The serpent says to her, he misquotes God. He said, And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, what had God told Adam? Do you remember? I had to go look it up. I had to back up uh, and, and look at it. This is what God told Adam in Genesis 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, notice this, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. Isn't that awesome? Of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So notice what Satan is doing here. Do you see what he's trying to do? Satan is misquoting God, and he's trying to make God look stingy. Did you, get, did you pick that up? He's trying to make God look stingy. He's trying to make God's plan look incomplete when God's plan is the best plan. Adam and Eve can freely eat from all the trees in the garden except for one. That's what God said. And what did Lucifer say? He said, and he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He's trying to say, you can't, God basically said, you can't eat from any of these trees. And God said you can eat from all the trees except for one. He's a snake. That, that's what people will call someone a snake. That's a, that's a snake right there. Don't you think? You've had too much coffee, bro. All right. <laughs> hey, if I, if I ever get intense, and I'm not angry. I just get intense, right? Give me another cup of coffee. <laughs> now, I want you to think about the, this. Does all of this sound familiar? Amen. Yeah. Build back better? Are you kidding me? Build back better? This is code for destroy now, leave no stone intact. Amen? Amen. What a deceiver. I mean, that's Lucifer incarnate. And if you can't see a believer, you are blind. Wake up. Right? Unbelievable. Blows me away. And you're right. I get fired up. I'd be a light if I could. I'd be on a field trip right now. Calling down the fire. Did you know Jesus Christ, when he comes back in his glory, all the eyes of the people who pierced him will see him, and they will fear and ask for the rocks to crush them because they will fear the wrath of the Lamb. Amen? The little tiptoe Jesus ain't coming back. It's warrior Jesus. It's lying Jesus coming back. And it ain't going to be no build back better according to Biden's program. Right? Tear his program down and rebuild it, Jesus. Amen? I'm just getting started. <laughs> no, because it's y'all. It's y'all. So this is exactly the devil's strategy, right? Every follower of his since, uh, w whether it be people or politicians who serve Satan directly or indirectly, indirectly, their desire, whether they know it or not, is to destroy now and leave no stone intact. All you need to do is look at the fruit, not what they say, right? Jesus said, you will know my disciples by the good fruit they produce. Not whether or not they are Catholic or Protestant or if they go to mass, so what? Yada, yada, yada. The fruit, the proof is in the fruit, amen? amen. The policies, that's where the fruit is. I was watching this week these, these videos on the Gospel Coalition, and the Gospel Coalition probably started out good with Tim Keller, even though he's theistic evolution. But what happened with it, I noticed this, even when I was at the former church, that people would just keep, kept saying, just preach the gospel, the gospel only. We don't want to talk about these other things, just the gospel. And I thought, why are you taking the Bible and sticking it in the corner and locking it up? The gospel has an effect on the culture, Amen. amen. And then I realized after watching this outstanding interview with a man by the name of Doug Wilson that this was a very clever thing that a number of these people, these mega church pastors who are in centers, this thing's not working. 
forget it. Where's the mama grab a mic? Okay. So, in centers like New York City, they go soft on all the issues, homosexuality, abortion, because they don't want all these people rallying at the church. They buy into theistic evolution. They do all these things. And then they can conveniently say, we, we're gospel-centered. We're just going to preach the gospel. And they say, the churches shouldn't get in bed with politics because then the baby that's produced is what? And I'm thinking, so what are you doing? Getting in bed with the liberal Democrats, right? Right? I'm gonna, I, I know Trump wasn't perfect, but I want to vote for him because he's pro-life. He's pro-Israel. He's pro-family. And we're not going to just preach the gospel. We preach the gospel as a center, but the word of God touches all of these areas, right? And so it's a very clever technique that uh, clever technique that Lucifer, I think, used, not to say that everybody in the gospel only or the gospel coalition was doing this, but the drive was, oh, Christian, you can only preach the gospel. That's how you get run out of a church. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm passionate about that topic. You know what? It, it, it is not nonsense about the gospel, but John the Baptist lost his head not because he just preached the gospel to Herod, right? He lost his head. You'll see him one day. His head's going to be back on his body. <laughs> but this is why, that, that this is a, a, a large reason why over the last 25 years I have not followed a lot of movements like that. Because to me, it becomes about someone's agenda. And I'm not saying, you, you can say, well, he's the, I'm, I know I'm known as the political pastor. No, I think we should be known as Christians who take the gospel wherever it needs to go. Amen? Yeah. The devil's strategy, right, is to keep you silent. Just keep you in your little corner. Lucifer, as, uh, as Hitler said to the church, he said, you preach the gospel. You save souls. Leave me to rule the world. You see, that's the, this is the dichotomy we're talking about here. This is the kind of nonsense that has led to 200 million people being slaughtered by the communists. Yeah. Right? And if, if you don't get upset about that, you don't have a pulse. Yeah. And I know sometimes as, as lay people, you don't read the books and, and do the study in these different areas. But this is exactly what's happened before. Oh, yeah, you church people, just keep your little message inside your building. That's what our French mayor in St. Paul told me. He said right there with his assistant mayor, he's taking notes the whole time we're in this beautiful office in this St. Paul where all the actors and Tom Cruise, they pull up in their Ferraris and have dinner up there. Oh, it's a cool place to live. I loved it. Believe me. Olive trees everywhere, fig trees. You know, it was, it was awesome. The mayor told me, he said, essentially that his policy on religion was like that of China. And he said, you'll be fine. Just keep your church inside the building. And I almost came out of my seat. The only reason I didn't is we're leaving soon. And I thought, I'm just going to lay some good ground for the next person. So, um, so I went out and I got him a couple of gifts. I took it to him. I went up. I told you the story before. I go up there, I got, my, I got my clogs on, I got my hair back, and cool sunglasses, you know, you know, you gotta dress for that climate, you know, you gotta look the part. I go up there, and this, you know, secretary's there, and I leave the gifts for him, and so I walk way down these steps, oh, a bunch of steps, I get down to the bottom, she, she runs down in her high heels, runs down, and she says, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 the, the, the mayor wants to see you. And I'm like, I'm shocked, he wants to see me after, like, kicking me to the curb. And he's like, oh, thank you so much for the gifts. This is so kind. That's the way to a French person's heart, by the way. <laughs> Buy them some gifts, and they will, they will love you forever. So he couldn't be nicer at this point, and I knew we were leaving soon. But, you know, many of these people, that's their, their view of religion. Keep it to yourself. Went to a conference with the Family Research Council, and Tony Perkins used to say, you know, the trouble with pastors and Christians is that oftentimes we self-censor. We self-censor. We don't speak up. We don't share the gospel. I'm not saying be obnoxious. We didn't go over to the Capitol and be obnoxious, but we prayed for the people. We were there. We're present. So that's the challenge with us at times, not to self-censor. Censor. If God leads you to share the gospel with a person, share the gospel. Amen. We need to take back the ground. We can do it. So Lucifer, in this first scene 
in humanity. Okay, you wonder why am I bringing this up? Because the first scene here in the garden, Lucifer is, this is what he wants to do. He knows God is in charge, but he wants to take control. Amen? You see that happening in our world? Mm -hmm. Lucifer sees God is sovereign and in control, but he says, look, I got another alternative plan. I'm going to take charge. I'm going to take over Washington. I'm going to take over Augusta. I'm going to take over the seats of power. I'm going to take over education. Let the Christians pull back and let me take over. You see, all we need to do, good men, evil will triumph. Is it Edmund Burke who said it? All good men need to do is nothing. Evil will triumph when good men do nothing. And that's just what Lucifer wants. Exactly what he wants. So Eve got part of the commandment right, didn't she? Now, what part of that did you see here that she didn't get right? In the reading of Adam, I don't remember God saying, don't touch the fruit. Did you see that in the reading yeah. of Adam? He didn't, he didn't say, God didn't say to Adam, you can't touch the fruit. He said they were not to eat or consume the fruit. Now, I know, think about that. Touching leads to grabbing. <laughs> grabbing leads to biting. <laughs> and biting leads to eating. I mean, right? So I agree. Like, once you grab it, like, oh, wow, this, that's a nice piece of fruit right there. <laughs> wow, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, like, well, gosh, you know, the next step. So even though it wasn't stated in the text, don't touch it. Yeah, touching does lead to grabbing, grabbing leads to biting, biting leads to eating. So notice what the tempter says next. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. Another lie. For God knows that in the day, okay, so now his appeal is, you're not going to die. Let me show you the benefits of eating this fruit, okay? I'm going to give you all, the, I'm going to give you ten benefits to killing someone, okay? I'm going to give you ten benefits to stealing and whatever else, whatever other sin you want to commit, I'm going to give you the ten benefits for why she, you should do it now. That's what he's doing. He's making a case, and a quite good case. Go ahead, Eve. What are you waiting for? You'll not surely die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Well, why wouldn't you want your eyes to be open? Why would you want to think that you're missing out on something or that you're unenlightened, right? I, I'm not going to die, Lucifer says. He's, he's obviously charming. He's beautiful. He's, he's a good conversationalist. I, I, I mean, this is, seems like a reputable figure. Maybe he came from God. Maybe God changed his mind. Process theology, right? God is still speaking. Maybe God changed his mind. And he said this beautiful little steak my way. Right? God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And notice this one. You will be like God. Can you imagine that? Someone came up to you or that appeared to be a representative like this, this, this snake, and said that you're going to be like God? Well, who doesn't want to be like God? That's incredible. You'll know good and you'll know evil. Now, I want you to think about this one. Consider when you were younger... How many of you, your parents let you play with matches? <laughs> yeah. Okay, don't do this, but I remember, I, I, when I was, I don't know what, what age I was, I had a gas can and matches in the backyard. I don't know where my, my parents were gone or something. So I'm like just fooling around with some gas. I knew enough to put the top, and then I lit the match, and then it would do this. Well, anyway, I, I must have spilled quite a bit of gas, because I lit a match, and it went, it was like a trailer. It went, where are we going to play? We're playing City. And I remember freaking out, like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to burn that place down. You know? Okay, so think about that. Matches and lighters, you tell your child not to play with fire when they're really young, right? Knowing full well that one day when they mature, they can use fire resourcefully to cook, to stay warm, right? Unless you're a crazy grown-up kid and you're still... At that. <laughs> That's when you become a fireman, okay? Right? <laughs> you want to fight fire, you just go ahead and be a, be a fireman. Okay, so think about this one. Consider a good parent telling their child, you can play outside, just don't play in the street. Right? You can play outside, just don't play in the street. 
I lived in town growing up. We rode our bikes, and my parents, when we were a certain age, just said, stay on the sidewalk. Don't get in the street, okay? Okay, so basically, the fear is that, you know, if you're playing in the street one day, you could get potentially hit by a car and possibly die. So notice Satan's plan and advice would be like telling the same child this, right? Have your, have your parents indeed said that you cannot play anywhere outside? That's essentially what Lucifer was saying to Eve. Have your parents said that you can't play anywhere outside? Well, what did the parents say? You can play anywhere you want outside, just don't play in the street. Amen? Amen. Now, how many of you as adults have done stupid things in the street, right? You know what I'm talking about. Don't try this, children. Don't do this, right? But you know what I'm talking about. Like you've, you've laid down in the street like because you know no cars are coming with your friends. And then you get up because you know there's no cars coming. Don't try that, okay? Kids, don't try that. But what I'm trying to say is as you mature, as you mature, you understand the dangers where you don't know the dangers in advance. So I want you to think about this. Here we find the first, this, uh, this is my viewpoint, revisionist history. This is the first revisionist history. It's the first revisionist theology. And it's the first revisionist legislation. Okay, think about this. It's revisionist history because Lucifer is trying to change the story on what God has already told her. It's a revision. Okay? It's revisionist theology because God said, look, if you want to stay in fellowship with me, here's what you do. If, if you want to separate the fellowship, here's what you do. He revised the theology. And then he revised the legislation because this is God who has created the legal system, essentially. Not the one we have now, but the, the law. He's revising the legislation. Do what you want. You'll be fine. So is that deja vu? Think about when you see revisionist history, when you see revisionist science, when you see revisionist laws, all the work of Lucifer. Does that make sense? He does it in every field because he's a liar and a deceiver. So again, wherever you find people attacking the truth of God, they're motivated by Satan whether they know it or not. So think about this. This account is historical. It happened in space and time. It is theological, God's truth. Theology is the study of God. And it is law because God said it and he instituted it. Here we find the first antichrist. No law, no rules. Do you remember Pinocchio? It's one of my favorite movies. Remember that? Remember the, uh, the, the guy comes through and basically tells them all to the boys. He's like, come with me to this place. You'll get to stay up late. You don't have to listen to your parents on anything. You can eat candy all day and all night, right? And so all these kids are like, no rules, no curfews. Count me in. So they all get on the wagon, remember that? And they go into the thing. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing donkeys. You're like, what are all these donkeys doing? Well, what was happening is the boys were turning into donkeys, right? Remember that? Because they went to this place where they could do anything they wanted. And his real motivation was to turn them into donkeys that he could use for his slave labor. Wow. You see, when the devil tells you, hey, no rules, no laws, anything goes, just think about turning into a donkey, right? He won't tell you that, right? The devil is saying sin will not hurt you. It will bring you enlightenment. That God's pr uh, present plan does not provide. You will become a higher life form. You will be like God, knowing good from evil. So the serpent twists the truth. And yes, Adam and Eve, notice this, they would not die right away. That part was true. They wouldn't die right away. But death would enter into the human race, as well as eternal death, hell, which was created for the devil and the fallen angels. So notice we've seen the tempter, we've seen the temptation. Notice, thirdly and lastly, the tragedy. The tragedy of Genesis 3, 6 and 7. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, 
and desirable to make one wise, she took of it the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they, were, they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. <clears throat> so notice Eve's first mistake is that she got into a debate, right, with the devil. She got into a debate with the devil. And I don't doubt at all that she was highly intel intelligent, highly intelligent, right? Highly informed in many ways. But the devil been around longer, I think. Smarter. Smarter and cunning, as we said, a deceiver. And in her state, as a perfect being, she was not cunning. She didn't have a desire to trick someone through deception, but he did. He's formerly one of the highest and most intelligent angels. The devil lost his place, and now he wants to help others lose their place with God. Think about that. He lost his place with God. Now he wants to help others lose their place with God. That's the tragedy of it. You see believers go astray and walk away, and that's exactly what he would want. And he'll use people, he'll use circumstances and different things. But just remember, whatever you go through in your life, you're not worshiping and serving people. The, the center of your worship should be God. Amen? Stick with him. He's not going to leave you or forsake you. And people will. Yeah, people. You got to hold on loosely with people sometimes, but God will never leave you or forsake you. So the devil lost his place, and now he wants to take Eve and Adam with him. And just remember, that is the devil's goal. And for that reason, Jesus called him a liar and a murderer. And Jesus said that he had come. Do you remember this? He said, I have come to destroy the works of the devil. I have come to destroy the works of the devil. So the tree was not evil. Okay, the tree was not evil. The tree was good for food. The tree was pleasant for the eyes. But for Adam and Eve, God said, don't eat it. Okay, Adam and Eve said, or Adam and Eve said, if they had said that, they might have survived it. But Adam and Eve, right, God told them, don't eat it. Even though it, was, it wasn't evil, the tree was good for food. It was pleasant for the eyes. Now notice this. I don't know about this, but I read this. That some have speculated that God might have allowed them to eat it later in their maturity. Somewhere down the, the, the line, right? After they were walking with him and they were growing in, in knowledge in his ways. But for now, it was forbidden. And eating it would bring the whole human race into a state of disconnectedness with God and creation and each other. Again, that's just speculation. No one really knows that. But think about as an adult, you know the dangers, as we said before, of the street. You know the dangers of playing with fire, right? But you know how to safely maneuver because you know the rules. Once they eat, they know now that they were disobedient. They feel shame, and the shame brings what? Brings guilt. They knew that they were disobedient in that moment. Their eyes were open, and they did know good from evil. They feel shame, and the shame brings them guilt. Now, there's two kinds of guilt. There's healthy guilt, and there's unhealthy guilt. What is unhealthy guilt? Unhealthy guilt is when, you know, your parent says, you're dirty, you're dirty, you're dirty, right? And you're, you know, you got some, you know, some ketchup dripping down your face. You're so dirty, clean your hands, right? And you just feel guilty like, oh gosh, I'm dirty, I'm dirty, I'm dirty, right? That's, that is unhealthy guilt, right? Parents should realize that kids drip ketchup down their face. We, they spill milk on the counter, right? I spill milk on the counter too, Lily. Don't worry. You know, we all do it. <laughs> Sorry when I'm not so gracious when you do it. But, <laughs> but, but the point is, right? That's, un, that's an unhealthy guilt that, like, a, sh a parent, an unhealthy parent, if you shame your child into something, right? If they went to bed or just whatever it is and you're not patient with them and you're shaming them, that, and you create in them this sh sense of shame and guilt, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a false guilt. That's not something that you should feel guilty about, right? 
Then there is good guilt. That's where you actually did eat the apple. You sinned and you got to fess it up to it, right? You, you blew it and you're like, sorry, Lord, I sinned. And I feel guilty because I sinned. That's healthy guilt. You see that here? They're for the first time feeling, they're feeling healthy guilt. And so what happens? They now feel, they now see that they're naked and they make their own attempts to cover themselves. This is the first uh, example of religion. It's the first example of religion. This is the first example of sinful people trying to make themselves presentable to God. And this is my own reading on this. Many others have come to this conclusion that they're covering, right? They sowed what? Fig leaves to make themselves complete. As we will see, God will provide a covering from them. An animal would be sacrificed and he would give ultimate redemption as we're going to see next week. While Adam and Eve's sin was great, God's mercy and forgiveness are greater. Think about that. While Adam and Eve's sin was great, not great in the great sense, just great in seismic, God's mercy and forgiveness are greater. He can provide forgiveness to the worst of all sinners. Think about that. He can provide forgiveness for the worst of all sinners. You know what the worst of all sinners bring? They know how bad they are. You know, sometimes if you're raised in the church, if you're raised in the church and you, you know, you cradle, I was a cradle Christian. Yeah, I mean, not a, I wasn't a Christian in the cradle, but, you know, take it to the Methodist church, christened, went through confirmation, all of that. That can easily lead a person to think, well, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm better than most people. I was raised in the church. That's a delusion. Because you know what? That, fair, that tax collector, he knew that he was a horrible man. He knew that he was a horrible sinner. And the Pharisee next to him is like, so glad that I'm not like this tax collector. <laughs> Fast on my mint. You know, I do this. You know, I do that. I pray a hundred times a day, you know? I mean, like, oh, look at the Muslims, you know? We pray five times a day, do almsgiving, and do all these things, right? And that can lead you to become delusional about your position with God. And so that is the benefit of the people who come to Christ out of a terrible sinful background. Now, the trouble is sometimes, because the enemy knows he tries to lure them back, right? Tries to lure them back. Probably remember two years ago, three years ago, was a woman coming to church. She gave her testimony about drug addiction, about prostitution, about all kinds of things. And she, in moments, was so passionate about Jesus and what he had done for her. And you don't see many Christians with that kind of passionate love and joy. And then what did the enemy do? Oh, keep my eye on her. I'll draw her back. She's got old friends. Pray for her. You see how he works? My point is, he that's been forgiven much, Scripture says, loveth much. That means if you've been pulled out of the darkest, ugliest, slimiest, wickedest pit of hell, man, you're just like, woo -hoo! You know, when I see somebody in worship, and I'm not, uh, we, you know, we all express ourselves differently as Anglos, but man, when you see somebody just like, like this, you know, I mean, you're probably thinking, they've been through some stuff, and they know Jesus pretty deep. Amen? Amen. Well, the rest of us are kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, get my hands up. Somebody might be embarrassed. You know, like, they don't care because, you know, they just strip naked before God. Like, they're like, you just dragged me up off the floor and I couldn't do a thing and now all I want to do is praise. You see how they want the heathen has been forgiven much, loveth much. You see it in the Gospels. This woman comes in, probably a lady of the night, uses a very expensive jar of oil on Jesus' feet. 
washing his feet, his dirty feet, with an expensive oil and using her hair. And here's a Pharisee watching all this. And here's Judas. This oil could have been used to bring in money for the treasury of which I dip in regularly for my private affairs. <laughs> hey, Judas. Yeah, really, I'm sure, Judas, you really care about the money for Jesus, right? Like, you really care about that. And Jesus hadn't f seen worship like that in Israel. Lady of the night. He that loveth much. He has been forgiven much. Loveth much. He who has been forgiven little. Loveth little. Straight out of the gospel. The thing is, the enemy will try and make you feel as a sinner before you come to Christ or even as a believer that, well, you're unforgivable, you're untouchable, you should just stay home. No, you should come to church. Somebody said to me recently, they're like, well, I'm into this, I'm into that kind of new age stuff, and I can, I, can I come to church? I'm like, absolutely come to church. What are you thinking? Don't stay home, right? <laughs> Why would you stay home? I mean, we want all the sinners coming up in here. I mean, they might throw stones at me from my sermons, but, you know, we want people coming to church, you know? As they say, the, the church is not a country club for saints. It's a hospital for recovering sinners, right? We're redeemed in Christ, but we, have, we need to be in fellowship with each other. We go off the deep end, any one of us at any moment, right? So he tried to make her think, look, you'll become like God. And then after it was over, don't you know? He said, you're not redeemable. Are you kidding me? So the thing that he tempted her with, I'm sure this came later. The thing that he tempted her with, oh, it's going to be good for you. It's going to make you live. You're not going to die. You're going to have wisdom and you're going to be like God. And then after she did it. He's like, no, you're going to die, and I'm going to tell you the date you're going to die. You're going to die physically, and you're going to die in hell. What do you think about that, lady? Whoa, a little while ago, you just said I was going to be wise. I was going to know good from evil. I'm not going to die, and I'm going to be like God. And now you're saying I'm going to become a donkey? That's what Lucifer does. He's not your friend. The devil is not your friend. Think about all the bands now, the young people watching and pushing, and all the bands we listen to, the Stones, all this crazy stuff. I wish I could go back and get my money back for all that <laughs> concert I saw. I mean, that would be a nice retirement right there. Instead of giving it to Aerosmith and Blue Oyster Cult and all those groups. And the reformulated Leonard Skinner. I saw Leonard Skinner in concert. Sweet Home Alabama, yep. Along with a bunch of other rednecks all passed out with whiskey bottles and hair down the hill and their shirts on. I was like, at this concert, they're littered, the field was littered with old big rednecks with empty whiskey bottles passed out. And I'm listening to Yeah, let us get it. My point is the devil would love to pluck any of us back, right, into the old ways. Well, I gotta I gotta get I gotta start moving toward wrapping up. I wanna give a few illustrations that I think will lend themselves uh, to just edification from the sermon that we've looked at today. And there's stories, a couple of them are quotes, but I'll wrap up with these, there's several of them. There was a marshal in Napoleon's army, and he was a man who was devo devoted, he was enthusiastically attached to Napoleon. He was mortally wounded in battle. And as the last struggle drew near and he lay dying in his tent, he sent for his chief, Napoleon to come for him. The poor man thought his emperor could do anything. Think about that. He thought the emperor could do anything. And perhaps he even sought to put him in the place of God. So he earnestly pleaded with Napoleon to save his life. The emperor sadly shook his head and he turned away. But as a dying man felt the cold, merciless hand of, a, of death drawing him irresistibly behind the curtain of this unseen world, he was still heard to shriek out, save me, Napoleon, save me. In the hour of death, that soldier discovered that even the most powerful Napoleon could not give him physical life. Think about that. How many people, they're putting their trust in someone or something besides the Lord Jesus Christ that they think 
is going to be able to save them. A.B. Simpson is reported to have said that the gospel tells rebellious men that God is reconciled, that justice is satisfied, that sin has been atoned for, that the judgment of the guilty may be revoked, the condemnation of the sinner, oh, you got it right there, canceled, the curse of the law blotted out, hey, thanks to Ben Hogan for doing this, the gates of hell closed, the portals of heaven opened wide, the power of sin subdued, the guilty conscience healed, the brokenhearted comforted, the sorrow and misery of the fall undone. Think about that. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. As we're going to see next week, that is what he predicted when he said, the serpent will bruise your heel. Jesus would die on the cross. But Jesus' death and resurrection would crush his head. C.S. Lewis once wrote that when the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade but what is the good of saying you are on his side then when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and someone else comes crashing in? This time is, will be, uh, it will be too late then, right? He said it will be too late to choose your side. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen. Whether we realized it or not, now, today, it is the moment. It is our chance to choose the right side. I got one more illustration. But think about this. If you're not a believer, what are you waiting for? Amen. Amen. If you're not a believer, what are you waiting for? As Peter said to Jesus, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. I'll close with this. D.L. Moody once said, the thief had nails through both hands so that he could not work. He had a nail through each foot so that he could not run errands for the Lord. He could not lift a hand or a foot toward his salvation. And yet Christ offered him the gift of God. And he took it. Notice this. Christ threw him a passport and took him into paradise. Amen. As a believer, that's where you're all headed. You have ultimate Hope. So continue the fight. Even though we live in a fallen world, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Amen. 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 Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that this is not just sentiment. It is not wishful thinking. Lord, it is true. It is real liberation because you are God. You came down to earth and you have saved us. And Lord God, use us in this day in this age to reach those that you are calling and encourage the believers as they fight the good fight. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So John, is a credit to all the ladies here with backbone. If you notice in verse 2, he at least puts up a little struggle with it. It says, but God said, don't eat that. We go up to, go up to verse 6, and she just passes it off to Adam, and he just
you will reign and rule with Jesus Christ in his direct presence. And you are doing it now. You just don't see him. But when you see him, you will be like him. It will be worth it then. Amen? Amen. It may not seem like it now, but it will be worth it when you see Jesus. So as you go, he who began a good work in you will carry on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Stand strong in his power, in his might and authority. Amen. Amen.